More than a million fatalities were recorded in Katbalogan City, in Samar, and in Katanduanes. <laughs> The road here is completely washed out. There is basically nothing left of it except for slabs of asphalt and concrete. Let's get a clearer picture of Uwan's devastation in the province. The ground beneath millions of feet just shattered without warning. In the span of hours, the Philippines faced a catastrophic chain reaction that defied every disaster protocol ever written. What started as a single earthquake at dawn became something far more sinister. A sequence of natural disasters so perfectly timed, it seemed orchestrated by nature itself. Three minutes past midnight, seismic monitors across the Pacific began screaming. A magnitude 6.9 earthquake had just torn through the seafloor near Bogo Cebu, at a depth so shallow that its full destructive force reached the surface instantly. At just seven kilometers deep, the energy had nowhere to dissipate. It hit like a hammer strike. In a small barangay near Lapu-Lapu, a mother's instincts kicked in before her mind could process what was happening. The house groaned and swayed as she pulled her daughter from bed. The child grabbed her stuffed toy, a small comfort in chaos, as they stumbled into the darkness. Outside, neighbors emerged like ghosts, some still in nightclothes, all sharing the same wide-eyed terror. The aftershocks came in waves, each one resetting the clock on fear. Basketball courts transformed into refugee camps as dawn broke. Families huddled under blankets, radios crackling with updates that offered little comfort. The shallow depth meant maximum damage, cracked columns, fallen roof tiles and serpentine fissures running through concrete like veins. Buildings that had weathered decades of storms now showed their mortality, but this was just the opening act. At 9.43 a.m., while rescue teams were still assessing damage from the first quake, the earth convulsed again. This time, a magnitude 7.4 monster erupted off the coast of Davao Oriental. The timing couldn't have been worse. Hills already fractured by the morning's tremors now faced a second assault. Landslides cascaded down slopes that had held firm for generations. Within minutes, tsunami sirens wailed across the eastern seaboard. The science was brutally simple. When the seafloor suddenly shifts during an offshore quake, it can displace massive volumes of water, sending deadly waves racing toward land. Coastal communities from Mati to Bislig didn't wait for confirmation. Thousands fled inland, creating traffic jams on mountain roads as motorcycles, cars, and trucks all pushed upward. The Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology tracked every centimeter of sea level change through their network of tide gauges. At Tandag Station, sensors detected a 30-centimeter rise, enough to trigger protocols but far below catastrophic levels. Other gauges across Davao showed only minor oscillations. By early afternoon, with no evidence of a destructive surge, authorities lifted the advisory. Some called it a false alarm. Others understood it as the system working exactly as designed. Better to evacuate and return than to hesitate and perish. But for 90,000 people, returning home wasn't an option. Their houses lay in ruins or teetered on the edge of collapse. Then nature revealed its cruelest card. Typhoon Krathon swept in while the ground was still bleeding from seismic wounds. The storm found every weakness the earthquakes had created. Rainfall totals exploded past 200 millimeters in places, with some areas recording 80 to 100 millimeters in single hours. On normal ground, this would cause flooding. On fractured, unstable slopes, it triggered apocalypse. In northern Cebu's uplands, hillsides that had barely held together after the quakes now liquefied. Entire barangays vanished under torrents of mud and debris. The Lobok River in Bohol, swollen beyond recognition, breached its banks before dawn. The mayor, watching real-time data from weather stations, declared a state of calamity while most residents still slept. 
Pre-positioned rescue boats became lifelines as floodwaters invaded the town center. The mathematics of disaster multiplied exponentially. Water found every crack the earthquakes had opened, turning hairline fractures into channels of destruction. In Compostela, a hillside that had stood for centuries surrendered without warning, erasing three homes and the families within them. The death toll climbed to 269. Most victims claimed not by wind, but by the deadly marriage of water and fractured earth. Before communities could even begin counting their losses, satellite imagery revealed another horror approaching. Typhoon Yingxing had exploded over Pacific waters heated to nearly 30 degrees Celsius. Within 48 hours, it transformed from a tropical depression into a monster with winds forecast at 215 kilometers per hour. Weather scientists watched in alarm as conditions aligned perfectly for rapid intensification. Low wind shear allowed the storm's core to tighten like a coiled spring. Warm ocean waters fed it endless energy. The forecast cone stretched across the eastern seaboard like a target painted on the nation's back. This time, the threat wasn't just rain and wind, it was storm surge. As Yingxing's counterclockwise winds pushed ocean water ahead of the storm, surge maps lit up in angry reds and oranges. Predictions showed water levels rising 2 to 4 meters above normal along exposed coastlines. Families who had just survived earthquakes and floods now faced a wall of water. From Katanduanis to northern Samar, evacuation orders triggered another mass exodus. Coastal barangays emptied as residents grabbed plastic bags of clothes and sacks of rice, heading for gymnasiums and schools on higher ground. Many didn't wait for official orders. The memory of Krathon's devastation was too fresh. Scientists from the University of the Philippines Resilience Institute deployed cutting-edge technology to understand the compounding catastrophe. LIDAR scans and satellite data revealed the earthquake's hidden legacy. Hillsides shifted by up to 10 centimeters, creating networks of tension cracks invisible to the naked eye. These fractures acted like time bombs, waiting for water to provide the final trigger. The research delivered a chilling conclusion. Slopes that once required massive rainfall to fail could now collapse with just 80 to 100 millimeters. The warning signs became a survival checklist. New surface cracks, suddenly muddy springs, trees beginning to tilt, or scarps where earth had dropped. Each symptom marked a hillside preparing to surrender. In the midst of scientific warnings and official evacuations, social media became both savior and saboteur. A Facebook post claiming a 15-meter tsunami would strike went viral, shared over 3,000 times before noon. Panic rippled through coastal communities faster than any wave could travel. Roads clogged as families fled based on digital rumors rather than real data. Officials scrambled to counter the misinformation with facts. Tide gauge charts showed the truth. The highest detected wave measured just 30 centimeters. Emergency managers reminded terrified residents that storm surge and tsunami were different beasts entirely, and that calibrated sensors, not social media shares, determined real danger. The cascade of disasters revealed a harsh new reality for millions of Filipinos. Climate change and seismic activity had formed an unholy alliance, creating conditions where recovery couldn't keep pace with destruction. Each disaster weakened defenses against the next, turning the nation into a landscape where the next alert could arrive at any moment. Traditional disaster preparedness assumed time between crises. Time to rebuild, time to strengthen, time to prepare. That assumption died somewhere between the first earthquake and the second typhoon. Now, resilience meant accepting that multiple disasters could strike simultaneously, that weakened ground could amplify storm damage, and that preparation might be the only barrier between survival and tragedy. The little girl with her stuffed toy became an icon of this new reality. Her family's basketball court shelter evolved into a semi-permanent home as engineers declared their house unsafe. Each night under fluorescent lights, she clutched the toy that connected her to a life before the ground split open. Her story multiplied across thousands of families, all learning that in this new era, disaster wasn't an event, but a condition. As rescue teams transitioned to recovery operations, the true scope emerged. Hundreds of thousands displaced, infrastructure shattered, and landscapes permanently altered. The Philippines had always lived with natural hazards, but never had they combined with such devastating synchronicity. The question haunting everyone wasn't whether another disaster would strike, but when. Seismic stress didn't simply disappear, typhoon season would return. 
Climate change guaranteed more intense storms feeding on warmer oceans. The only variable was human preparedness, the ability to read warning signs, trust scientific data over social media panic, and evacuate when seconds counted. For a nation straddling the Ring of Fire and Typhoon Alley simultaneously, the cascade of disasters marked a turning point. Old assumptions about recovery time, disaster spacing, and infrastructure resilience crumbled like earthquake-damaged concrete. The new normal demanded constant vigilance where today's survivor could be tomorrow's victim if preparedness faltered. As communities began the long journey of rebuilding, they did so with a transformed understanding. The earth beneath could betray them without warning. The sky above could unleash fury on fractured ground, and sometimes, nature would throw everything at once, testing every protocol and pushing human resilience to its absolute limit. That's it for today, folks. See you in the next video.